Welcome back from lunch. I'm Scott Wall. My presentation is Making Waves. I believe that water waves are an electrical, electrical phenomenon. This is my background. From the, uh, I graduated from the University of Waterloo, uh, Bachelor of Mathematics. Uh, took applied math with applied math with <coughs> physics electives. And I took a couple of years with a joint math and computer science major. Uh, I was six years old when uh, the seeds of addiction were planted firmly in my psyche. That's when my parents bought a sailboat. Uh, when I was a teenager, the addiction continued when my parents bought a windsurfer. Uh, when I was 10 years old, I took up water skiing and I was hooked as well. So I had to figure out how to balance the optimize the fun and by looking at the waves, or looking at the calm, if it's a calm day, you want to go on the, uh, you want to do the wind water ski, and if you want to do, you want to do this when it's a windy day. Uh, in, Water, in Waterloo, uh, the seeds of dead were planted. I learned that the wind waves, wind was caused, wind causes waves, so waves are proportional to the wind. Which I applied to my optimization of fun algorithm, and I had troubles with that because it didn't always seem to work out correctly. Uh, my neighbor also got a sailboat, and quite often he didn't know about the wind wave phenomenon. So he's going out when there's small waves, and he's zipping back and forth. I go out when there's big waves, and as I'm slowly drifting through the large waves, I'm having doubts that there's this relationship. I think there's something else. Uh, I also learned in introductory physics that the gravity of the moon affects the tides, and that was left as an exercise to the reader. They never actually explained how this could be. And special relativity, I learned about the twin paradox, which I'm sure we've already just, many people have discussed. All three of those cascaded each other and I had doubts about most of them. The water waves, these are the acknowledged wave contributors. Uh, the gravity of the moon and the sun affects tides. The wind is the disturbance generator, it kicks up the waves. The boat wakes for a disturbance generator. Gravity of the Earth attenuates the waves and minimizes their effect, or minimizes it causes them to dissipate. Let's start with tides. Supposedly the moon, sorry, the moon, uh, the gravitational effects of the moon causes the uh, high tide here and a high tide here because supposedly the up here is not being pulled, or it's being pulled away from here to here, but this part, the explanation is rather flaky as far as I was concerned. Uh, the source of the wind is what, uh, in court meteorologists, the source of the wind is basically air masses, temperature differences in the air masses, warm air rises, cold air comes in. But on the windsurfer, I'm not seeing that. Uh, the wind effect on the water, uh, according to mainstream theory, there's a Bernoulli, Bernoulli effect, the wind blows over it, reduces the pressure, which causes the water to rise. There's also tangential shear of the water being blown across. On the windsurfer, as I said before, Waves aren't always proportional to the wind. Uh, sometimes you get wind, I've said no wind, and you get waves for some reason. Uh, then you get wind directional reversals, so it's going along one way, and then all of a sudden it switches, goes the other way, and then switches back again. So this is, if you're having warm air rising, then it seems that the mainstream explanation would be the air rises, and then it rises too far and says, whoops, it went too far, and then flips around and goes the other way. 
And then, whoa, went too far again. So that's the only explanation I could think of with the warm air rising. So most of the gusts of wind, the air just suddenly realized, oh, wait a minute, there's warm air over there. It's rising. I better rush over. That doesn't make any sense. The sun is supposedly heating it continuously. Why do you get the gusts? I also noticed that the dispersion of the boat wake, dispersion rates, usually the boat goes by, you get the wake, it comes, hits the shore, you get slight reflection, and then it's gone within a couple minutes. Other times, when it's choppier, you get boat wakes that just seem to go on and on. They go back and forth a few times. Nothing scientific, of course, just it just seemed that it's going a lot longer. What's missing from the standard mainstream theories? Uh, I'm not sure if some, uh, Gerald Pollock was at the NPA meeting in 2011. He discussed structured water. He has a book, A Fourth Phase of Water, where he discusses a, uh, he discusses a elastic sheet model, which is H2O3, so two hydrogens, sorry, H4O3, I think it is. Anyways, the hydrogen for water molecules form a helix, not a helix, they form a hexagon. These hexagons become layered and structured, and apparently that's how the surface, they, some are the modern physics, mainstream calls it surface tension, and it allows lizards and such water bugs to walk on water, but it's because of this structure overlapping, creating a latex, or creating a matrix that's pliable, and it uh, is flexible and provides structural coherence. Uh, Gerald Pollack also thinks that this provides the coherency to the waves, so that's how the tsunamis can travel around the world without losing their energy. I think they can go around several times because they have coherence because of this, this structure, nature. There's also electrical effects. Uh, when they were creating these oceanic theories, electromagnetism, completely out of the picture. They had no idea that it would have any effect. Uh, if you take uh, atmospheric electricity, there's 100 volts per meter. Uh, it's been confirmed by several people. Uh, and if you take a balloon and stick it over top of a bowl of water, you get this uh, bulging effect. Apparently the water's being lifted. This is not structured water, this is just regular water. And apparently, because the balloon is negatively charged, the positive the chart, because of the water is dipole, the, uh, see, the oxygen molecule gets pulled up by the balloon and creates this rippling effect. Uh, this atmospheric electric uh, uh, gradient, they've done neat measurements and shown that as the uh, gradient as the volts per meter increases, so does the voltage, apart from this initial anomaly here. Uh, so if you have an electrical storm, then you're going to have a higher volt per meter, and you're going to have a higher wind velocity. That's a direct relationship, which implies that electromagnetic effects in the atmosphere are what's responsible for the wind. Atmospheric pressure, barometric pressure. Emmanuel Velikovsky, back in uh, 50 years ago or so, was questioning whether barometric pressure was in fact also electric. He noted that there's 
daily fluctuations, the peak at 10 a.m. and 10 p.m., and they end at 4 a.m. and 4 p.m. This does not correspond to peaks in temperature, peaks in sun. It's anomalous, so we suspect that electromagnetic phenomenon. Gravity, the tides, let's go back to the tides. We're going to examine uh, the mainstream and problems with it. The force of gravity at the surface of the ocean. So if you look at a water molecule and figure out how much energy, or how much the force that's being attracted to the Earth and the force that's being attracted to the moon, uh, force that's how you guys did that. Okay, force is the, and we're all familiar with this force constant, um, force, uh, gravitational force. If you take the ratio um, at the set, at the level of the surface level of water, of the oceans, the ratio of the force from the Earth to the force of the Moon is 290,391. That's the force from the moon is, it's like an ant trying to push an elephant over. It's not going to happen. And if you look at the sun, it's a little bit better, but it's still 1,624. It's like a mouse trying to push over an elephant. It's likely not going to happen. But if you think that it uh, could be the electric magnetic attraction, because the electric, according to the electric universe theory, the sun is, uh, the solar wind is positive uh, protons, H plus coming in. The earth is negatively charged. Excellent. The earth is negatively charged, so the, that creates a attraction from the, uh, from the earth up to the positively charged upper atmosphere. The structured water that Gerald Pollack uh, has proposed is also negatively charged because of the excess uh, electrons. So the neg negatively charged electrons are attracted to the protons from the sun, causing it to be uplifted and repelled by the uh, negatively charged Earth. <coughs> Another point in favor of the gravity being attenuated by electric forces is that Dr. Charles Lucas, uh, 2011, came up with the universal electrodynamic force, which some of you are probably familiar, where he uh, calculated the force between the proton and the electron, and showed that it was an electromagnetic phenomenon. Gravity is just a subset to so unify the forces. Let's take a look at water waves now. Uh, the barometric pressure, uh, if it's an electromagnetic phenomenon, and if it's gravity is an electromagnetic thing, electromagnetic force, then if it attenuates it, it will be, uh, you're going to have, the waves will appear longer. And the phenomenon I saw earlier where the displacement waves from a boat seem to last longer when it's choppier, that would uh, fit in with the attenuation, high pressure pressures uh, cause the gravity to be increased or lessened, or not lessened as much as, if you have a low pressure system, you're going to have uh, more waves. Which is what you see in a storm surge. Storm surges have this uh, surge of water being pushed onto the wind, being pushed onto the shore, which is the tangential shear pushing the water over. And in the eye of the storm, where you have low pressure, you have this pressure surge which pulls the water up. 
Another uh, similar phenomenon is the water spouts and the dust devils. Dust devils, they've measured the electrical properties in a dust devil and they've noted that the, uh, there's a high voltage, 4,000 volts per meter, much higher than uh, the regular 100 volts per meter. I would think that uh, the water spouts, which are just dust devils on top of the water rather than on top of a lot of dust, or desert area, think they would have the same type of thing. You have a negative in the middle, and it's being pulled up. So it's sucking the water up from the cloud, from the water to the cloud. Tornado, very similar thing. Uh, there's been many uh, people have survived being in the eye of a, her eye of a tornado. Mark Spann, a member of the NPA, uh, was in the eye of a tornado. He was inside a bathtub with his two neighbors with the curtain pulled over his head, or pulled over the, themselves. As he was sitting there, lying there, the tornado went directly overhead. He experienced a, uh, this is how he described it, he described it as a roller coaster type feeling of uh, when you go over and your stomach gets flipped up. He said that was the experience that he had. And that it wasn't a Bernoulli effect pulling the water, pulling the uh, pulling them up. Because the sheet, the shower curtain was not lifted up. The shower curtain stayed where it was, even though it was two hundred miles an hour wind. That's the shower curtain's there, and his. Uh, I attribute it to, I believe, the inner ear is what's causing the uh, feeling of weightlessness. Either inner ear, or the stomach, or the brain. Something's being lifted up. Um, Gerald Pollack says that the a lot of the biological um, organs contain structured water, which is how they. Are, how they function, because they're able to exclude certain things. And if it's structured water, that means it's negatively charged. If it's negatively charged, then it's going to be lifted by the, uh, repelled by the negatively charged earth, and the, the fact that there's less uh, positively charged stuff in, the, in this uh, tornado is going to be less resistant, so it'll be act as a lifting force. In addition to uh, tornadoes, there's also the stories, many stories of uh, unusual precipitation such as frogs, snakes, fish falling from the sky. How, this, how these creatures get up there is one question. And why is it just these creatures and not a bunch of rocks and mud and other such debris? And I suspect it's because the frogs, snakes, are all creatures, but living creatures with structured water in them. So they have a negatively charged system. So they, the charge separation, so things get separated by charge. So they get up, got lifted up in a swarm and then they got dumped when there was not enough uh, uplifting forces to sustain them, so they just fell down. A lot of times these frogs would hop away, a little bit confused, but <laughs> they just hop away. Very resilient creatures. And lastly, my favorite, the rogue waves. Uh, these waves are two, or they're 30 meters sometimes in height, which is rather uh, spectacular. The mainstream explanations for them are that mariners like their big fishtails, and these do not exist. Uh, Larry Kinsman was the, I, he was the uh, one that was quoted in my fluid mechanics course. 
and he compared the rogue waves to uh, John Prester and unicorns, both fictitious creatures. Uh, another, what they've come up with lately is that the rogue waves are a quantum effect because they uh, exhibit behavior that's compliant with Schrodinger's equation. They don't explain how or why, even where that came from. And they claim that the rogue waves, since they're rogues, they're stealing energy from their neighbors. Which doesn't make any sense. But it makes, it's an explanation that they can pawn off and people say, oh, I guess they know. Schrodinger's occasion, woo. Maybe they're all complacent because they've got an explanation. But the uh, structured water, I think, is what gives it co coherency. <coughs> and quite often they run along the South African coast, is where you usually you find most uh, freak waves. They're also called freak waves. What happens is you get currents going in different directions. Even though the currents are not on top, they still have structure with them. So you get waves on the lower, la lower layers. And if you have waves on the lower layers going against waves on the upper layers, then these layers do not want to compress. So they just go on top of each other. So then you get a magnifying effect. So you can double your wavelengths easily just by having them run against each other. If you have attenuated, it's also stormy down there. I believe there was a sailing boat that circumnavigated the world and they got struck by lightning once in this same area. A lot of storms, a lot of electrical activity. That means there's a lot of uh, negative, or no, a lot of low pressure, which means attenuated gravity, which gives it the ability to rise even higher. In summary, I think that electromagnetism, structured waves, and the Venturi effect contribute to water behavior. And that you could, they were demonstrating that if you had a strong enough magnetic field, you can levitate a frog. But whereas most of us don't realize that strong magnetic fields have an effect on water molecules. So maybe that might be something for us for you to pursue, to just to take a look at it. That sounds really interesting. Yeah, I mean, it was, it was quite a strong field, but you could, and it was a living frog. It had no ill effects on it. And it's still living afterwards. Yes. I'm like Schrodinger's cat. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah, I'd just like to uh, remark that uh, the way you take the fields and the structures and the architecture, but then take it to the mechanics of how it works, and that's at the point where you start to understand it, where it starts to become credible, and, and you did a very good job with that. Thank you. No compliments allowed, only argumentation. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Are you really saying that 
uh, tides yes. are not caused by the gravitational pull of the Yes, moon. that's what I'm saying. They are not? No. Right. I don't see how they could be. The gravitational force, are you often pulled up by gravity when yeah. the, there's a full moon? Yes. <laughs> no, no, I'm not. Why do people uh, weigh themselves when it's a uh, full moon? We have to explain spring tide then, when the effect of the moon and the, and the sun come because together. It's, because the uh, protons from the sun attract the electrons from the structured water, and they pull up on the, on the ocean surface. And on the opposite side, the protons are leaving, and as they're leaving, they're pulling the electrons with them. So it's an attractive force, despite what they <laughs> no, no, I, you know, I don't think there's necessarily a problem there. Yes. Here's, here's what I would say it would be interesting. You know, I'm not, I never dispute anything in the right when I hear it because I learned that's a bad idea. <laughs> but what if we were to take some other type of liquid? Some that type of liquid okay. that didn't have these properties. Mm -hmm. Would it too be affected? Because then if it be, was affected, then we could say, and it wasn't, didn't have the electrical properties you're talking about, right. then it would say, well, then water could just be because of the force. Of the, right, right, I'm just saying is, that would be, I'm saying I would suggest an experiment like that. Mm -hmm. So we would, I don't know what kind of liquid, uh, mercury, I don't know, uh, you could have sitting there and if it's not, if it doesn't have the same electrical properties, will it then be affected less? Yes. And you could actually do a little, an experiment. Yes. So. I can add another uh, empirical observation here. I've noticed on occasion a tremendous increase in the pull of gravity after ingesting a large amount of vodka. <laughs> <laughs> now, very tides good. have a variation on them from yes. as they go through the month. Yes. So have you accounted for that pattern in, what, in your work that you're doing? I think spring tides I think I thought about that and then noticed that the seasonal pattern, the seasonal patterns, and I thought, okay, that makes sense. I didn't uh, go back and say, okay, does it follow through? I mean, is there, can you like show some correlation between the strength, the changing strength of the tides, and maybe our relative position to the sun? Or I mean, well, isn't it? Isn't, isn't the moon? Uh, the moon isn't. It, doesn't it? Moon is pretty it's, much constant, but it gets, it gets the charge from the sun because I. The charge on the Earth, I think it bleeds it off really quickly. A day, I think it bled off all its charge, and it gets new charge from the sun. Although, but there'll be great. I'm not sure what's bleeding or It's confusing. So, so, but um, okay. The other question I would have is, gravity has to have some effect, right? Gravity does have some effect yes. on tide. Yes. Yes. So that. Uh, I, I, I don't know, maybe. Aren't the tides delayed by like an hour each day? Don't they trail with the, the moon? The tides follow the moon, though. Yes. Yeah. So is the moon exerting the electromagnetic charge? I think it's going through the Earth? sun. I think it's from the sun through the moon. Because the moon is the dominant, it's still, yes. you know, whether it's gravity or whatever, yes. the tides do follow the moon. Yeah, yeah. Like I an mean, hour delay moon. each day or something. So the yeah. electromagnetic effect has got to be from the from the moon. <coughs> Whether it's because it's so much closer, yep. and yet the uh, yeah. ratio. Well, that's, that's gravity. That's gravity. I'm saying yeah. well, the moon has to be the sort, the yes. primary source of the electromagnetic effect yes. to explain the tides. Not, I mean, whether that's mm -hmm. the effect, maybe, whether it's channeling the sun or not, it still yes. has to be the because yeah. the it's tides don't follow the sun; they yes. follow the moon. There's a little bit following the sun, but it's mostly on the moon. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the moon's the sort of the, Electromagnetic source yes. that's pulling on the So, just so I'm clear, you're saying that it's not so much the gravitational attraction of the moon as so much as it's some electrical attraction. Attention, attenuation of electromagnetism. I think it's the electrical attraction okay. of the moon. Why, why, why do you eliminate gravity? Because of this ratio. This is gravity, yeah. and the gravitational force yeah. is minuscule. Up. Things don't fall from the Earth up to the Moon. So why would 
the water be. So you're saying like for every molecule of water, the gravitational force on it is minuscule compared to a, a proposed electromagnetic force? No, uh, yes. Um, well, what I'm saying is the gravitational force of the Earth completely dwarfs the gravitational contribution from the Moon. If anything, it should, it should be following the Sun. Yes, based on gravity. It should be following the Sun. It should ignore the Moon altogether. Tide should follow with high moon and as yep. the day. Exactly. Well, it depends. The sun's a lot further away, though, too. But, but this isn't this this calculate. Well, this has R in it, though. This is yes. calculation with. This is the distance the R from the sun and the mass of the. That's a, M is the mass of water, like a water molecule. M is the moon, and then Actually, big M is the M, and then big M is the sun. I assume. Because yeah. you're, you're doing the pull on a on a water molecule at the surface of the Earth. Yes. One from the sun and one well, from the moon. Well, pull of anything. Mm -hmm. Just the generic. Since it's a ratio, it doesn't matter what the well, thing is. Uh, that equation at the top for Newton is, is an equation of the combined forces on the uh, moon, because it's, it's got both of them there. It's got the moon it's got two masses. And, the, and, the, uh, yes. and the, the earth, okay? Yes. So it's both of them. But what what happens gravitationally, and I'm not I'm not I'm speaking more gravitationally than electrostatically, is in in fact what really happens is you got to divide that equation in two because half of that force is actually on the Earth and half of that force is on the Moon. Now at first that sounds ridiculous, but when you change to acceleration, you take this force that's on the Moon that's causing it to orbit and you divide it by the mass of the moon, you get a fairly good number of acceleration towards the Earth. When you take that same value of force that's on the Earth, but divide it by the mass of the Earth, you get a very small acceleration. So what you have is you, you have two accelerations, mm -hmm. equal forces, very little acceleration on the Earth, a lot of acceleration on the moon, and most people think, well, heck, it's so small on the Earth, I'll just make the Earth zero right. and apply it all to the moon, and that's what Newton's equation does. But in fact, the forces are equal. The forces are equal. Okay. I think, yes. yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, we have that's okay. We're we're still we're we're all figuring this out at the same time. Yeah. The problem is you bring up something interesting and we get all. <laughs> <laughs> that's your that's your fault. <laughs> Don't you wonder why yeah. why times do not happen in the Sahara Desert? In the Sahara Desert, you have you see a sea of sand, just like you see an ocean, mm -hmm. but you don't get any any tide of sand. We have always wondered why. You now give me a, a kind of explanation, yes. Why you don't because have that? In electrically inert. The same as electrically inert. But I'm still puzzled about the reign of fish and frogs. The, okay, that it existed or that? Whether it really exists? Oh no, it has. They're, they're documented even on. I think yeah. even recently. Yeah, even recently, yeah. I think, well, I think that's actually maybe, a, yeah. a good maybe, explanation. Maybe, that's right. Nine fish. Yeah. Yes, like science fish. fiction channel has sharp nails. <laughs> sharks, sharks are falling from the sky yeah, on the science, on the sci fi channel. Oh, okay. <laughs> maybe dead okay. fish and dead frogs, but not, not like uh, snakes as well. Yeah. And worms. Yeah, but I, I think that when I saw that, I, that was a very surprise. That made, really made me think. I never thought of it that way. Because you're right, you don't, hear, you don't have raining rocks, you don't have yeah. raining. Well, you do sometimes. Yeah, well, yeah. But, Raining twigs and mm -hmm. yeah, it's not common. I think I think with tides, in my opinion, I think we're going to we have a lot to learn until we get a model of what gravity is, yeah. electrical forces, all of this. I think we're going to be saying that yes, these could be factors. But I think until we get those models, we're going to be all how, how do you say making educated guesses. Right. And, and I think what you're bringing up is. Is, is amazing. I was thinking to myself just now when, when my dad was saying about the acceleration, the Earth wobbles because of the moon. Right. We know that. If it's wobbling and you have oceans, mm -hmm. those are going to slosh. I mean, that's also a possibility that that could cause. Who knows? Mm -hmm. What I'm saying, there's a lot, a lot, a lot of effects. 
Right. And we know that. So I think, you know, um, the idea that that water has special properties, I, that's definitely true. But I think until we get these models, we're not going to be able to answer exactly what is the effects. I think it's probably complicated. Yeah. Yeah, I is. think it is. Well, especially wind waves. Yeah. Because to say that the, this wind causes this wave, because in the book, the Larry Kinsman book, it says, okay, this, they've got a box C, there's a box, and then the waves are generated, uh -huh. and then they escape the box, and then they're no longer subject to the wind. That's the type of stuff they're dealing with. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the wind wave, it's all just hypothesis and right. mathematicians going crazy, writing up differential equations, and it's cool stuff. The equations are wonderful, but do they really apply? Yeah. Yeah. Please, may I see one of the, the diagram in which we have the, the, the rise on one side at the same time, another rise on the opposite side? Oh, the, the first, your very first picture, which had the equal bulges. Yes. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That bulge went back there. Yeah. Yeah, this one. Okay. Yeah, I said that another. Why do you want the over the side? This bulge. Yes. Yes. That's really the case. Yes. yes. That is the case. Yeah. Where does it come from? <laughs> Yeah, because you electric. expect this whole thing to be pushed out. Mm. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because the gravitational effect here is even, is even smaller than it is here. The, 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 the far tides are bigger than the near tides because those two planets, that moon is large enough that those two planets are what I call binary planets. They mm -hmm. actually orbit each other as they go yeah. around the sun. Mm -hmm. So they orbit around a common very center, which is about a, a, a one one quarter of the way in on the near side. It's about there. No, no, it's it's inside. Inside. It's in the earth. Inside. In the earth. It's about right a thousand there. miles deep within well, the earth. Seven, it's, it's, it's inside there, yeah, about, about one quarter of the way in. Yeah. So now the what what you really have is you have the moon orbiting around that very center in a circle going around in the circle. Okay. You have the Earth going around, the center of gravity of the Earth going around in the circle around that very center. And they're orbiting each other. So what's happening is this edge is moving faster than that edge. Therefore, the momentum of this water is actually seven times greater than the momentum of that water. That, that linear momentum has an outward component pushing that water up. It's centrifugal, so, right? It's centrifugal, isn't it? I don't like centrifugal. I like a linear momentum with an okay. outward component. What is that? Okay. But, it, but you could call it centrifugal, yeah, but I don't... It's not like spinning it. about the Earth's center. It's The Earth is spinning about okay. off-center. So the yeah, far side tide is always <laughs> greater because it's got... It has, in terms of that linear down. force, it's seven times <laughs> greater. <laughs> And this but the moon can't be pulling for that. Uh -huh. The question is for you is, is if it's electrical and it's a re related to the moon, how does the other side happen? They're binary planets. The moon is a that side, yeah. Electrically. I was picturing because the solar right, it is actually a good sized fraction of the Earth. The moon is somehow channeling a solar. The moon is. Has to be an electromagnetic source. Right. The solar, it's, it's almost like the moon is channeling the solar wind or something. Or else the moon is pulling, or else there's, if, if water has the electrical charge mm -hmm. based on Pollock's theory, Pollard, Pollock's Pollock. theory, Pollock. Pollock. Yeah. okay. Is it possible that the opposite, uh, that one side of the Earth, the side closest to the moon, has an abundance of one charge? The Earth wants to stay neutral, so the other side gets an abundance of the other charge. And that repels the water on both sides. They don't need a solar wind explanation. You just need the moon to be electrically charged in a way that it polarizes the Earth's electrical charge. If water responds to electrical charge, then you don't need a solar wind explanation. Because the solar wind explanation, unless the moon somehow 
deflects the solar wind so that it follows the moon would, would say that the tides have been following the sun. Mm -hmm. They're obviously following. They're obviously following the moon. The question is, if it isn't gravity from the moon, it's got to be something else. Mm -hmm. The image is the charge. This side will be oppositely charged. Yeah, because the Earth yes, wants to stay moving, right? So yeah, right. Yes. so this side's positive. That side's yes. negative. Yes. The water gets repelled because the water is also electrically charged. Yeah, and the, like I said, yeah. I mean, that's the way you could yeah, describe it. The question is. And the question is, how do you make a mechanical model of the the fields that do that? Is that a drawing? Which I don't know either. Yeah, just skip it. Not a satellite, not a satellite, not a picture of the space. No, it's the uh, is a drawing. I think, at least so. We don't compare with the electrostatic. Yeah, just skip the internet. Right. Well, that's yeah, right. You know, the gravity that was on here. Yeah. The gravity is electrostatic. <laughs> okay, any more questions? I have a question. Okay. Um, what causes this bulge? Well, uh, I mean, that, I'm a gravity guy, right? Right. And I would just, to, to, I'll answer the question, but I was just saying, if as a gravity guy, I'm going to measure what's causing that, I'm going to take a gravimeter there and measure it, right? I'm looking for gravity. I'm looking for the result. He's going to take a what, a galvanometer or, or, or something else. He's going to go to the same spot, measure it. He's going to get an electrostatic field. Now you tell me which one it is. They might be related too. Pardon? They might be related. <laughs> they might because be related. Fire. But the uh, uh, the moon, and gravitationally, uh, you expect them to have the highest tide on the near side of the moon because it's closer, and Newton's law says that, and, and even my own equation follows that, uh, that uh, principle. Uh, and, and so the far side become, becomes the question, but uh, they, they do attract each other. To make the point a little stronger, there's not only tides of ocean tides, but there are continental tides. The continents actually move up. Do they really? Okay. Yes, sir. The continents move up to the extent that there's continental tides on the moon. I, I gave a presentation about two years ago that talked about does the moon spin? Because we always see the same face on the moon, right? Well, it turns out it doesn't spin, and the reason is there's continental tides on the moon where the Earth is pulling the continents of the moon, and so you got a bulge on on the, at the near side of the Earth, and you got a bulge on the near side of the moon, and those bulges are keeping the moon facing as it goes all the way around. The moon isn't spinning, it's locked. Yeah. It's actually called a tidal lock between the moon and the Earth. But it isn't it spinning in the sense as it goes around the Earth, it turns. Uh, yeah. okay, it turns, it yes, the earth. you said it, turning. it turns, it rotating. but it doesn't spin. Now the question okay. is, what's the difference between turning and spinning? Yeah. Spinning, to me, is you, you have to have an axis where all the particles move in a circle around the axis. Yeah. It doesn't happen with the moon. The moon. A moon has a libation, and if you watch it over a longer period of time, you'll see it go like this. <coughs> the face of the moon goes like this. And, and, uh, and that's not spinning. <coughs> I, don't, I don't know how you can conjure that to be spinning. That's it's wobbly. Wobble. It's a wobble, but uh, it's called libation. And, and also to, to back that up in expansion tectonics, it's one of the reasons you don't have mar mares on the side that the back side of the moon. It's because of this this lock. As it's expanding, it's going to want to expand in, in the direction where it's being pulled more. Where there's less force. Yeah. And so that's why when, when they saw the...